work is equal to the change in energy. But what are you talking about? We're talking about velocity, momentum, and kinetic energy for these two rocket cars. We have rocket engines putting forces on these two cars. A smaller car of 1,000 kilograms, a more massive car, twice as massive, a 500 Newton constant force from each rocket engine, and they have 40 meters to go before they fall off a cliff. Let's do it. Question one. What is the acceleration? I know an equation that can find the acceleration of a car. F equals ma. So I know we're going quickly here, but working through the details, the smaller car has a bigger acceleration of 0.5 meters per second squared. Question two, how much time does it take for the car to reach the edge of the cliff? New question, new equation. We call this the second kinematic equation, d equals one-half at squared. Good thing we found the acceleration of each of these cars. And working through the math, taking a square root, the larger car spends a longer amount of time before reaching the edge of the cliff, 17.9 seconds. On to question three. What impulse was given to car one and car two? Impulse, J is equal to force times time. Constant force of 500 newtons times those two time values that we calculated there. And there we have it, the impulse for car one and car two. How about the final velocity, the speed of car one and car two as they approach the edge of the cliff? In order to find this, we'll use a, another kinematic equation, the first kinematic equation. Final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. This is kind of an interesting question here because the smaller car has a bigger acceleration for a shorter amount of time. So we have a bigger acceleration for a shorter amount of time competing against the smaller acceleration for the longer time and car one wins. It's going faster as it reaches the edge of the cliff. Next question, the final momentum of car one and car two. P equals MV momentum is mass times velocity from the previous chapter. And that means we have, let's see, mass times final velocity, mass times final velocity, values for the final momentum of these two cars. And these two momentum values make us very happy, very happy because they match what we found earlier with a little bit of rounding. You'll have to excuse the rounding here, but with, they match. Impulse really does equal change in momentum. Nice. Next, how much work? was done on car one and car two. Well, that's a new equation now. Work is equal to force times distance, and they both have the same force. Acting over the same distance, the same 20,000 joules of work is done on each car. And then the final kinetic energy, that's a new equation for this chapter as well. Kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So one half times mass times final velocity squared, same 20,000. Again, rounding necessary but dangerous. Here we have the same 20,000 joules, so we add it all up for these two rocket cars. Velocity, momentum, and kinetic energy. The little car had the greater velocity. The bigger car had the greater momentum. Both cars have the same kinetic energy. So yeah, velocity, momentum, and kinetic energy are all related, but they are all different. Our focus, however, is on work. Work is equal to change in energy. Work is equal to force times distance, or better said, work is equal to force times displacement, the x component of force, force along the x direction times delta x. If you're pushing a car, you're, you're not a rocket, but you're pushing a car here with a force and you push over some distance or you push some delta x and you will do work on the car. Assuming it starts to move, and yeah, if there's a delta x, it starts to move. You are changing the car's energy. You are increasing the car's kinetic energy. Good for you. And then you stop, and the car drifts, and then friction causes it to come to a stop. Friction, this time friction is the new force. Friction is doing work on the car. Friction is changing the kinetic energy of the car. But notice the direction of friction. Direction matters. We're talking about displacement here. Direction matters. And friction, you could say, is in the negative x direction. So here we have friction doing negative work on the car. Friction is decreasing the kinetic energy of the car. But not all forces do work. Here a weightlifter is getting very tired. 
exerting great stress and strain, sweating, doing all those good things, but not doing any work as you just hold the mass there. As you just hold this weight above your head, you are getting very tired, but you're not doing any work. You are not changing the energy of the weight as you hold it stationary. No offense, but you're kind of useless. You should be replaced by a peg in the wall. Here's another person exerting great effort, fulfilling the requirements of their terms of employment, deserving a paycheck, not doing any work. This person carrying a suitcase this person is exerting a force in the y direction and then the distance is in the x direction so this person carrying the suitcase at constant speed is not changing the kinetic energy of the suitcase not changing the energy of the system again no offense but you should put that thing on a little cart and give it a little push and save your back work is equal to change in energy leading us to the law of conservation of energy reminds me of the law of conservation of momentum the law of conservation of energy says that energy is always conserved unless it's not. When there is no external work done on the system, then the total amount of energy is conserved. For example, when a ball falls down, it converts gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. The equation for gravitational potential energy is mgh. The equation for kinetic energy, as we've already seen, is one half mass times velocity squared. Notice that mass cancels out from both sides of the equation. Thank you to Galileo, who told us that objects fall independently of their mass, and then you can solve for the final velocity. Final velocity is equal to square root of 2gh. This is the third kinematic equation. I've mentioned the first two kinematic equations already, but if you square both sides, vf squared is equal to 2ad. It's the same sort of thing. So it's all connected, like hopefully the roller coaster stays connected to the track. And here we have a roller coaster track, and we'll let a ball release the ball from point A and let it roll down to point B. And as it gets to point B, it's traveling fast. How fast? Well, that equation will tell us how fast it's going. Again, we're converting gravitational potential energy at point A to kinetic energy at point B. It fell 7 meters. It's going now. 11.7 meters per second and then it rolls uphill to point C. How fast is it going now? Well, let's plug in our beginning point A, final point C. It's fallen from A to C. It fell from 7 to 3 meters. It fell 4 meters. Final velocity is 8.9 meters per second. And that's kind of, that would be really difficult if we were trying to solve this with our kinematic equations. We'd have to worry about it speeding up, and that's a curved track, so our acceleration would be changing. It'd be speeding up from point A to point B, and then slowing down from point B to point C. We don't have time for all those details. Just talk about the starting at point A and the ending at point C, and we're good. And this velocity of 8.9 meters per second is the velocity anywhere at this height. Unless, I mean, maybe you do an experiment and it's a little bit less than 8.9. What's happening there? Well, friction is robbing your kinetic energy. Friction is doing work and changing the energy of the system. Work is equal to change in energy. Conservation of energy. Let's take another look at the situation. Maybe this time you don't just release the ball at point A, but you give it a push. So it starts out with some kinetic energy and some gravitational potential energy. Well, I'm not sure how high up you are. I'm not sure how hard you're pushing that object, but I do know the conservation of energy says that no matter where you are, the sum of your gravitational potential and kinetic energies will always be constant. Up and down the track, converting gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy or a spring gun. This time we have a different type of potential energy, not gravitational potential energy, but spring potential energy. You cram that pellet into the spring gun and then it's storing some potential energy and then it fires the pellet. Again, the conservation of energy says that when no external work is done on the system, the total amount of energy is conserved. Speaking of pellet guns, more on pellet guns later. First, let's talk about the collisions from the last video. We had sticky collisions. We had bouncy collisions. We had initial velocities and final velocities. We had the conservation of momentum. But do we have the conservation of energy? Here we have a sticky collision. And here we have the mass and the initial velocity of ball one, the initial velocity of ball two, the final velocity of the two balls stuck together. Momentum is conserved. Yes, momentum is conserved. But what about kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. And kinetic energy is definitely not conserved. 
Kinetic energy is almost all entirely lost. Where did it go? Well, imagine these are balls of clay. They collide together and they're deformed and they warm up a little bit, just like friction can create some thermal energy, some heat energy, much more on that later in the course, some heat energy, or just the energy needed to mold that clay. Play with clay dough for a while. Your hands will get tired. It takes energy to deform that clay. So here we have a sticky collision. Momentum is conserved. Kinetic energy definitely not conserved. How about a bouncy collision? The bouncy collision. What happens here? Masses, the same initial velocities, totally different final velocities there for this bouncy collision. And we wanted to, how could we find those values? The negative 4.4 meters per second, the 2.6 meters per second. How could we find those? That was a mystery last time. We'll answer it this time. And yes, momentum is conserved. And yes, kinetic energy in this system is conserved also. 59 total joules of kinetic energy before the collision, the same kinetic energy after the collision. The momentum of the system before the collision was the same as the momentum of the system after the collision, and the same is true for the kinetic energy. That's what makes it an elastic collision. Conserves both kinetic energy and momentum. An inelastic collision, a sticky collision, conserves momentum but does not conserve kinetic energy. An elastic collision, however, conserves both of them, and that means equations. And here's a long equation. I mean, it's just cumbersome. We have kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared, but there's two masses and four velocities to worry about. Velocity before, velocity after the collision for the ball one and the ball two. And here's another long equation for the conservation of momentum. And if you... I'll leave this as an exercise if you're curious to be. If you take all these quantities and these variables and you do all sorts of algebraic rearranging, you can get these two equations to spit out these two equations. And this is what we wanted. This is our equation for the final velocity of ball one and the final velocity of ball two. And these equations are intimidating and too long, and I don't feel like plugging numbers into them. I'd rather plug numbers into these equations. They're much shorter. V1F is equal to 2VCM minus V1I. But what is VCM? It's the velocity of the center of mass, that x, that mysterious x. We ended the last video with that mysterious x, the velocity of the center of mass. It was the same before the collision and after the collision for a sticky or for a bouncy collision. And we've already found it. The velocity of the center of mass of the system, that's just the final velocity of the two balls stuck together, that negative 0.2 meters per second. So we'll plug negative 0.2 meters per second in for the velocity of the center of mass of the system. And then we'll finish the equations off. And there it is. Yay. Negative 4.4 meters per second and 2.6 meters per second. We got them. And again, those details were, were a blur, I'm sure. But... What we're saying here is that a system with no external forces on it will conserve energy. An elastic collision conserves all that energy as kinetic energy. An inelastic collision will still conserve energy, but it will just transform that energy into thermal energy or sound energy or some other type of energy. You're not destroying energy. You're might, you might be making it less useful, less useful than kinetic energy is useful, especially if you're doing one of these things. A ballistic pendulum. This is the last part of the video. A ballistic pendulum. It's a spring gun. I told you there'd be a spring gun on the left there. Firing a pellet into this pendulum that moves. Here's a video of what I'm talking about. Again, the pellet goes into the pendulum and it causes the pendulum to swing up to a certain height there. If you have a heavier pellet or the pellet is moving faster, then the pendulum will swing up higher. And our job is to find the initial velocity of the pellet. And I'm going to play a trick on you, so don't be offended when I do. But here's how we'll find the initial velocity of the pendulum. It's a conservation of energy type situation. Initially, as that pellet is coming in, it's got a kinetic energy, one half mv squared, small m for the velocity of the pellet. And then it collides with the bigger m. It collides with the capital M mass of the pendulum, the block there, which rises up to a certain height. So we have kinetic energy is being converted to gravitational potential energy, one half mv squared is equal to mgh, the total mass times gh, and there's our equation for the initial velocity of the pellet, and this is totally wrong. Totally wrong, pause the video and try to figure out what I did that's wrong.
Okay, you don't want to pause the video. <laughs> well, here's what I did that was wrong. I was talking about uh, an elastic collision. This was a sticky collision. Did not the pellet stick to the pendulum? It was a sticky collision. And if there's one thing I know about sticky collisions, is it's that they conserve momentum, but that they do not conserve kinetic energy. They do not conserve kinetic energy. So what does that mean? It means a little bit more work. We'll start with this collision here. The initial momentum of the pellet is equal to the final momentum of the pellet and the block of wood together. Again, here we have a conservation of momentum. It's, it's the conservation of momentum type equation. We've seen this before. We're finding the final velocity of the block before it starts to rise after the collision, but before it starts to rise. Don't tell me the final velocity is zero when it reaches its maximum height. We know that. We want VF is the final velocity of the block before it starts to rise up, and then we have a block about to rise up. And what's the situation here? It's a conservation of energy situation. Conservation of energy, you'll recognize K plus U equals K plus U. One half MV squared equals MGH. And we'll rearrange that. Hey, there's that square root of 2GH equation again. We like that guy. We've got two expressions here for VF. And again, we don't really care about VF, so we'll squeeze them together, get rid of VF. And there we have it. An equation you could solve for the initial velocity of the pellet based on how high that pendulum rose off the ground. And you can see that the bigger the initial velocity or the larger the mass of the pellet was, the bigger delta y will be.